When you come into a topical series like this, it could come across as divisive. I'm not looking to be divisive. I'm looking to be accurate and holding true to the God's word. But I also realize that there are some that are sitting through this marriage that are going through very difficult times. Some that are entering a season of divorce or entering, exiting a season of divorce. Some are here and aren't married and God has given them the gift of singleness. So before we get into the message, I just want to stop and pray. Pray that we would have ears to hear, hearts to listen, and then lives to leave here changed by God's word. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into uh, this morning's message. Lord, I pray that you might give us faith to go where you would call us. And Lord, sometimes you take us out into deep waters, and Lord, we ask that you give us the faith to follow you. Lord, it's easy to talk about, so Lord, give us the strength and the courage to walk where you have called us to walk. Lord, I pray for those this morning that will hear this message that their marriage is in trouble. Lord, I pray that they may leave here in hope. Hope in Jesus. Hope that he can put things back together when husband and wife follow your leadership. Lord, I pray for those that are recently widowed or widowed at all. And Lord, this series could, could just bring hurt. Lord, I pray that you might comfort those that need comforted. And Lord, for those that are looking into marriage, I pray that they may listen and then be able to build their marriage upon the word of God as set forth by you in the book of Genesis. So Lord, give us a great time as we study together. Lord, we pray that everything that is said and done would bring honor and glory to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, pop quiz. If you don't know, just mumble because I really don't understand what you say anyway. And just kind of shout out random things and somebody will get it right, all right? So pop quiz, you earned the right to earn a free muffin, okay? Cafe, here they come in about 20 minutes. I'm gonna show you a picture of someone and I would like to know who this is. This is somebody that is... Wow, somebody didn't get breakfast this morning. Rick, great job. Joshua Chamberlain. All right. And yet you're still not leaving for your muffin. That's good. That's good. Joshua Chamberlain, the Maine man from Maine. He was known for what battle? Gettysburg. Hey, very go. Very good. All right. He was known for the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, I've given away two free muffins. No one's tracking. I'm not either, but it's okay. It's just fun to give away free stuff. <clears throat> what place in Gettysburg is Joshua Chamberlain known for? Little Round Top. I don't know who said that. Perfect. Perfect. Three muffins. Perfect. Free for you. They're free 99. As a Pennsylvania boy, some of you got that, that's good. As a Pennsylvania boy, I grew up going to Gettysburg. Didn't appreciate Gettysburg. But how come we're doing a marriage series called Hold the Line? Many, 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 many years ago in the Civil War, Joshua Chamberlain was on Little Round Top. And I don't understand all of it. I didn't research all of this. But that's your homework this afternoon, is to research Joshua Chamberlain. And the Confederates were coming through, and the Union line, friends, it was crumbling. And if they got little round top, the Civil War could be changed forever. So the story goes that Joshua Chamberlain, he hollers out, fix the bayonets and hold the line. Charge! And here come the Union down the hill against the Confederates to hold the line. Friends, this morning our marriages are under attack. 
And it should break your heart by the number of marriages that are struggling. Marriages that are just falling apart. And we have forgotten. I submit to you, we have forgotten the preciousness of marriage. We have forgotten and strayed away from God's original design and intent for marriage. And so this morning, what I want to do is start week one of four about marriage to hold the line. I want you to fix your bayonets and I want you to hunker down, not with me, but with the word of God, with what he says about marriage and realize we're under attack. Sometimes we need to hold the position and sometimes we need to fix the bayonets and we need to charge. When is it time to sit? When is it time to fix the bayonets and charge? I don't know. But what I do know is that we need to continually stand upon the word of God. So what I'm asking is that we fix bayonets and whether we sit and hold the line or whether we charge, that we charge fixing our bayonets, which is the word of God. Genesis chapter two this morning Anytime that I get to talk about leadership and Joshua Chamberlain, it brings me joy. But this morning, I want to go back to the first marriage, the marriage that God was at, the marriage that God ordained, the marriage that he brought together. And what can we learn? This morning, I'm going to give you four principles to hold the line for. I'm going to try to be gentle. I'm going to try to say this in love, but I'm going to get fired up. Okay, that's your warning. As we look into the word of God. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Well, you look at Genesis chapter 1, all through Genesis 1, that's your second piece of homework. What was your first piece? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. No one's taking, you got to write this stuff down. Okay, it could be a pop quiz. First one is Joshua Chamberlain's history. Second one is go read Genesis chapter one. God made creation and it was perfect. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. Sin has not entered yet, that's Genesis three. In the perfection of creation, no sin, no disobedience, just Adam and the garden, God looks down and says, hmm, it's not good for man to be alone. In the perfection of the Garden of Eden, there was something missing. Now, the first thing I want to point out is look at what he says. Look at this, that God has said this. Man, Adam, has a perfect relationship with God. Friends, the first, this is an extra one you can put in, you're not going to see one of the things we do in marriage is we think that our spouse is going to fix all of our problems. The first thing we need to realize is that we need to have the right relationship with God. This morning, we're going to talk about two relationships. The first one is our vertical relationship between us and a holy God. The second one is going to be between husband and wife. And we always put the emphasis on husband and wife. And hear me, we should. But sometimes we face so much time and put so much time on our relationship with our, my, in my position, my wife, that I sometimes neglect my relationship with God. And so the first challenge is Adam had a perfect relationship with God. Now you and I, we can't do that because of Genesis 3 and sin. But look, there is that relationship that God has with Adam and Adam has with God. My first question to you is, how is your relationship with God? Because we go so much emphasis on our relationship with our spouse that we forget to spend time with God. We forget to spend time with God, worshiping him and reading his word. So Adam has this perfect relationship with God. He walks with God, he talks with God in the garden. No sin. And God looks down and he sees Adam and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. 
It's the second thing we see. Adam is alone. God did not make us to live in isolation. It's why we're putting such an emphasis on Sunday night small groups. We want you to come and be connected. That's why we have in the foyer these puzzle pieces. We're trying to fit together the pieces of your family life to come together to be connected because we're not meant and created to live in isolation. In the perfection of garden, God says it is not good for man to be alone. He needs someone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. God sees the need. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. God is the creator. He is the one that has made everything. Genesis chapter 1. He made Adam out of the dust of the ground. He made every single living thing. God made it all. Out of every beast of the field and every bird of the sky, he brought them to man. Go back to Genesis 1. One of Adam's rules or his jobs was that he was to show dominion. And by having dominion, he could name all of the animals. Now, my question I asked in the text, and I got various um, opinions. Commentators are split on this, by the way, so I like to give both opinions. That whenever he came and the animals brought, were brought to him, they came either two by two, or in the classes. So some commentators say every single animal came before Adam. That is a poodle. That is a chihuahua. That is a beagle. That is a Doberman pincher. That is a Dalmatian. That is a Siamese cat. That's all I know of cats, okay? So some say he, that was pretty good. So every single animal came. Some commentators said that's too many. That's a dog, that's a cat, that's a lion, that's that. Which one's right? I don't know. Commentators are split. But it doesn't really matter. Because man came and he showed dominion by labeling every single animal. The cattle and the birds of the sky to the beasts of the field. And Adam sees this. Some commentators say that Adam saw these animals coming in two by two. A boy and a girl, a male and a female, Mr. Lion, Mrs. Lion, Mr. Bear, Mrs. Bear. And Adam's sitting there going, that's a bear. Hey, that's Mrs. Bear. Well, wait a second. He has one like him and she has one like him, but there's no need, nobody to meet my need. There's nobody like me. I am alone. And notice what happens. Notice this. I missed this the first three times I read the text. I will be vulnerable with you this morning. Adam didn't realize what he needed until he realized what he needed. And sometimes we're so quick to jump in to talk about what we don't need and meet the need before we realize we have a need. God is allowing Adam to see all of these animals and Adam's going, yeah, those two, they look alike. Yeah, those two, they look alike. They look alike wait a second, there's nobody like me. Even man's best friend, which is a beagle, by the way, even man's best friend can't fill that emotional void because there's nobody like me. And the first, the first place I'm going to call us to, to fix our bayonets is marriage be is between a man and a woman. Marriage is between one man and one woman. I am a pastor. I am not a politician. I am not here to be political. I am here to be biblical. God made Adam and God made Eve. And God saw that marriage and he put them together to meet the needs of one another. Biblical marriage the marriage that, if you the perfect marriage before sin entered was one man and one woman. The first. <clears throat> the first thing we need to do, friends, is we need to hold the line. 
with the attacks that are coming, we need to stand up and say, God's word is true. God made Adam, God made Eve. That is the way it is supposed to be. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. For your kids, for your grandkids, for your great-grandkids, marriage is between one man and one woman. May we always stand upon God and his word. First line we're going to hold. So God, the Lord God, he caused a deep sleep to fall, to fall upon the man. There are questions that I have that I cannot answer, and I don't know if the Lord will ever answer them when I get to heaven. But I don't know, but just let me wander for a minute. Did God tell Adam, Adam, you're going to take a nap, and when you wake up, there's going to be a really great present for you. Could this be like Christmas morning? I don't know. You know, the kids always go to bed at 6 a.m. on Christ, or 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. There's no fuss, fuss. There's never anything going on. They go right into bed. No need for water. No need for snack. It's wonderful. I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have, but what I do know is that God saw the need, God heard the need, and God met the need. And so he looked at Adam, and this is the first place that the biblical part of anesthesia comes in. He saw a deep sleep fall upon the man. He went to sleep. And when he slept, then he took one of his ribs out of the side of the man. Now notice where he did not go. He did not go to the foot of the man so that woman is underneath the man and I show dominion. Notice he didn't take any hair from the man because woman is not to be above the man. Notice where he took from the man, right here on the side, closest to his heart. Notice he took from the rib cage. In, my, in our house, uh, Holly calls this the cove. The cove. It's time for me to come to the cove. Is the cove open? The cove is always open. Oh, Is there a place to come? She's under my protection, not under my dominion, but she's under my protection, closest to my heart. Guys, put your wife in the cove. Bring her close to you. None of you have done the move yet. I'm really disappointed in that. So he slapped and then he took one of the ribs and he closed up the ribs at that place. And then what did he do? So the, the Lord God, he fashioned. This is a really fun Hebrew word. It is the idea of a potter. And the Lord is taking the time and he's molding this rib into a woman. Not just haphazardly throwing it in there, but he's taking the time. As creator, he's taking the time to say, Adam, I hear of the need that you have. And I'm going to take time and I'm going to form this woman. I'm not a potter. I'm not even a construction guy, but it's fun to watch this lump of clay on the wheel and then the potter spin that wheel and form this beautiful vase, jar, whatever pottery does. And it is amazing to watch his, the Lord's hand at this time form this woman. Notice how much input the man had. None. What's he doing? He's asleep. And God is fashioning the woman into meeting the needs of the man. And it is a delicate process. And ladies, you are the final and last creation of God. He saved the best for last. <clears throat> so, He's formed this woman, this beautiful woman, and he has awoken Adam. Hey, Adam, is Eve behind a tree? I don't know, friends. But just imagine the excitement of Adam. 
Here comes the need that I have. I just, I'm so alone. So he comes and he brings the woman, fashioned from the rib of the man, and he brought her to him. The first marriage is about to happen. Here comes the bride. Nothing more tear-jerking than the bride walking down the aisle with her father. That's when I lose it. This is the first marriage. Who is walking Eve down the aisle but God himself? One man, one woman walking down the aisle. The woman that God has fashioned and molded. So the man, he sees this woman. He's never seen her before. And look at his response. His response, he breaks out into song. This is bone of my bone, and this is flesh of my flesh. He looks at this woman, and he says, wow, you're just like me. There is a Mr. Bear and a Mrs. Bear. There's a Mr. Dog and a Mrs. Dog. Now there's a Mr. Man, and there's a Mrs. Man. You are just like me. And sometimes, friends, In marriage, we begin to focus on more of the differences than the similarities. Why did you marry your spouse? Why did I marry my wife? Some of you are asking, why did she marry you? I don't know. But sometimes we get so focused on what the differences are, we forget the similarities. And Adam wakes up and he goes, wow, you look like me. He didn't talk about the differences. He talked about the similarities. One commentator, notice before I get to the commentator, she shall be called woman. It's creative. There's man and there's woman. And notice what he did. He was able to give her her first name, woman. Guys, listen, don't walk around going, woman, that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. I'm just saying for a friend, that's bad. Don't practice this part. Ladies, are you with me? Okay. So he comes and she says, he says, your name is woman. He's showing his His ability to continue to lead his family. Because she was taken out of the man. This is part of my bone. One commentator said, Marriage was born in the loving heart of God for the blessings and the benefit of mankind. I don't know what kind of mourning you've had in your house with your spouse, but marriage is a blessing. Marriage is a benefit that God saw a need for. Friends, I think the second line we need to hold is we need to realize that marriage is a blessing and not a burden. Marriage is a blessing. Is it always a blessing? No. Sometimes Holly's sin nature just comes out and I have to deal with it. It's tough. It's difficult. Pray for me. It's, it's the burden I bear. She'll come to third service. I'm not saying that. We're going to edit that out of this service. <laughs> marriage is a blessing. But sometimes we forget to focus on the blessings of marriage. Sometimes we focus on all the differences and not the similarities. And friends, my, my opinion, this is my opinion. I hope, guys and gals, you will never introduce your spouse as my ball and chain. This is my ball and chain. Friends, this is not a prison sentence. This is a blessing from God because it's someone that you needed. This is not the ball and chain. This is the wife that God has fashioned and formed for you for your blessings, and for your benefit. So, for this reason, what reason is this? The reason that now Adam 
has someone that looks like him. The reason now he has someone to be social with. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. That does not mean that you don't get to have a relationship with your parents. That does not mean that you do not get to talk to your parents. But guys, what it means is you have to leave your parents' house, their protection, their provision, and your mama's cooking to go to be with your wife. You are to leave and cleave. Why? Because you found someone like you. And it goes back to the Corinthians where Paul wrote, find someone of like precious faith and be together. So you're going to be joined to your wife and they shall be one flesh. The third line that I'm challenging us to hold is loyalty and commitment. You saw it in a bumper. We say our vows for better or for better. In sickness, oh no, 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 no sickness, just in health and in health. Only in prosperity. Our vows that we take are for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. God is bringing Eve, in my mind, down the aisle. I don't know how this went. I wasn't I wasn't there. I'd love to be there. I don't know if the animals lined up. I don't know. I let my mind wander a little bit. But here comes God, and Adam is standing there going, you're just like me. You're a woman. We're going to get married. I'm going to leave my family, and I'm going to come to you. And there is a loyalty there. There is a commitment there, for better or for worse. And when, when couples walk down the aisle, they're only thinking of for better, but they're vowing for worse. Because marriage is not easy. If anybody tells you marriage is easy, tell them thank you for the advice and walk away. Because you're taking two individuals that have two worldviews and you're putting them in together with one house and they're supposed to figure it out and live together. And they're supposed to be happy while doing it. It's hard work. Are you with me? It's hard work. Okay, great. I'm the only one that thinks it's hard work. Great. It's hard work. Amen. Thank you. It's feeling alone up here. Who does the pastor see for marriage counseling? I don't know. It's hard work. But it's worth the loyalty and the commitment because they're vowing this in front of God. And Adam, he looks at Eve and the man and the wife, they were both naked. They stood there without any clothes on. And you know what happened? They were not ashamed. I thought about this for a while. There was nobody to compare to. Adam's not walking around going, man, I need to go to the gym more. <laughs> Eve's not walking around going, oh, wow. There was nobody to compare to. There were no barriers between them. There was no place to hide. And friends, this morning, sometimes in our marriages, we have hidden compartments. We have bank accounts that our spouses don't know about. We have places in our cell phones, on our iPads, on our laptops that our spouse they don't know about. And that is a barrier. Adam and Eve, yes, they were there without sin before the fall. But there was nothing between them. There was an openness. There was a vulnerability. There was this commitment to be together. There was a marriage without barriers. And I just wonder this morning, in your marriage, what barriers do you have? You see, sometimes, friends, we get so busy about life and we put our spouse on the back burner. Ah, I'll get to her. 
Ah, I'll get to him. And we forget that in the busyness of life, we need to take time for our spouse. Now, you can go back this afternoon if you want to and go read through Genesis 1. Adam was to tend the garden, so he had a job. It wasn't 9 to 5 or 8 to 4, whatever, but he had tasks that he had to do. But his tasks did not take the place of his marriage. And friends, this morning I wonder, what barriers are in your marriage? What, what's hiding? What's causing your marriage to have hiccups in it? I would ask you, what would it look like for you to go home, go on a date and say, honey, we've got some things to talk about. I've been hiding some things because I'm tired of having barriers. Adam and Eve are standing there completely in the open with no shame. Why? Because it's a perfect love. And perfect love drives out fear. Now, friends, I don't have the perfect marriage. And I don't ever want you to think I do. But today we have the example of what a perfect marriage should look like. What are those four things we're going to hold the line on? The first one is marriage is between one man and one woman. Always has been that way. Always will be that way at Crosspoint as long as I'm here. Second thing is marriage is to be a blessing. Don't look at your husband, women, don't look at your husband and go, this old ball and chain dragging me down. Guys, don't be introducing your wife. The old lady won't let me have any fun. Marriage is a blessing. What would it look like if you started looking at your marriage as a blessing and not a burden? Your guys, your wife is there to help you. Women, your husbands are there to lead you, to protect you in the cove because that's closest to his heart. Marriage is about loyalty and commitment. It's really fun to talk about loyalty and commitment when everything's going really well. It's not so much fun to talk about loyalty and commitment when things are not going well. But friends, you know what? When we're being attacked, we need to know that the person standing beside us has a fixed bayonet willing to hold the line based upon God and his word. First thing I ask couples when they come in for marriage, if they have marriage troubles, are you willing to fight for each other and stop fighting with each other? Are you willing to start fighting for each other and stop fighting with each other? And if they say yes, that tells me that they're loyal and they're committed. I've never been to war, but I've been to Gettysburg. And I can't even imagine the fear that those guys had when Joshua Chamberlain fixed the bayonets. But my guy right here beside me, he's got my back. Your guys, your wife, she has your back. Wives, he has your back. Why? Because marriage is about loyalty and commitment. Your homework for the next couple weeks, it's gonna be a four week homework assignment, which means it's lots of ice cream so you can thank me later, is to go out and start going on dates and going, hey, here are some of the things I haven't been telling you. That may not be an easy conversation for you to say, may not be an easy conversation for you to hear, but the wordage you can say is, I'm tired of having barriers. I'm ready for open communication. Stand with me the next four weeks and hold the line. Hold the line. But first of all, before you hold your spouse's hand, you need to make sure your relationship with God is right. Don't try to fix this before you fix this. This will crumble. Once you fix this, then this will be, be repaired. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. As you settle, two questions to ask you. The first question is, 
Is your relationship with the Lord right? Or is it strained? You may have come this morning for various reasons, and we're so glad you're here. Whether you're in building or online. And you've been challenged because your relationship with the Lord, it's not right. And you know it, but you just don't know what the next step is. The first step is admitting you need help. I'd like to pray for you. I won't call you out by name. I won't, I won't do that to you. That's not the desire of this. But I'd like to pray for you. And then the second step would be you'd see me in the back or see one of the guys in the yellow shirts in the back and say, I need help. That's the second step. The first step is, can I pray for you? Is there anybody here I can pray for? My relationship with God is not right. It's not where it needs to be. I need prayer. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody here online? I see that one hand. Would you send me a private message online? Love to minister to you. Second question I have. For those of you that are married, would you just slip your hand up and say, you know what, Tom? Uh, my marriage needs help. Would you pray for my marriage? Would you pray for my marriage this morning? I mean, I need help. Is there anybody here? See that hand, thank you. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. Yet again, it, it cuts right through to what we need to hear. Lord, help us to hold the line. Lord, help us to follow your pattern for marriage. Lord, that marriage is between one man and one woman. Lord, help us to see marriage as a blessing and not a burden. Lord, help us to be loyal and fully committed to our spouse. And Lord, in our marriage, may you take away the barriers. May you open up the, the closets, if you will, Lord, and help us to have open communication. Lord, for those that are here this morning, whether their hand was physically raised or their heart was stirred, Lord, they know that their relationship with you is not right. I pray, Lord, that you might give them boldness to spend time in your word. Lord, that you might help them to draw close to you because you ultimately are all that we need. Lord, help us to grow in our relationship with you. Lord, for those marriages that are in trouble, again, whether they raise their hand or not, that's between them and you. But Lord, you see the hearts. And Lord, where there needs to be restoration and reconciliation, may you have it. May you bring it. Where there needs to be forgiveness, may there be forgiveness. Where there needs to be the hard and bold conversations, Lord, may you allow it to happen. Lord, we do love you. And Lord, we love our spouse. Lord, help us to hold the line. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.